and these are in listen only mode. Hello, my name is Brittany Kavinsky and I just want to welcome everyone. It is now 1 p.m. so we will begin our presentation shortly. Today on Friday, February 3rd, we will have our presentation on opportunities and challenges in rural tourism planning given by Ann Krieg. For help during today's webcast, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box found in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen or call 1-800-263-6317. For content questions, please feel free to type those in the questions box and we'll be able to answer those at the end of the presentation during the question and answer session. Here's a list of the sponsoring chapters, divisions, and universities. I would like to thank all of the participating chapters, divisions, and universities for making these webcasts possible. This is a list of the upcoming webcasts we have scheduled uh, for the next few months. To register for these upcoming webcasts, please visit www.utah-apa.org slash webcasts and register for your webcast of choice. We are also offering distance education webcasts to help you get your ethics or law credits. These webcasts are available to view at www.utah-apa.org slash webcasts archive. Um, you can now follow us on Twitter, at Planning Webcast, or like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on the Planning Webcast Series sponsored by chapters, divisions, and universities. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, please go to www.planning.org slash CM and select today's date, which is Friday, February 3rd, and then select today's webcast, Opportunities and Challenges in Rural Tourism Planning. This webcast is available for one and a half CM credits. We are also recording today's webcast, and it will be available along with a PDF of the presentation at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast archive. Um, also, on behalf of Shana Johnson, the, uh, the Professional Development Officer of the Economic Development Division, I want to thank um, the EDD for sponsoring today's webcast, and you can connect with um, the Economic Development Development Division via their website or their blog or on Twitter at APA underscore EDD. And at this time, I would like to introduce Ann Krieg, who is our speaker for today. Ann Krieg has been, uh, was the Planning and Development Director for the Town of Bar Harbor um, since 2002 up until um, last June. Um, her duties included serving as Vice Chair of the Cruise Ship Committee, the Vice Chair of the Part Parking and Traffic Committee, and the Chair of the Development Review Team. She also served as a staff support to the Economic Development Task Force, Conservation Commission Planning Board, Appeals Board, and Design Review Board. She was also the town's Public Information Officer. Anne has presented throughout the country on the intersection of planning and tourism in rural landscapes. Anne is on the Board of the Maine Board of Maine Association of Planners and is the Vice Chair of Special Projects, Session Coordinator, and Awards Committee Chair for the Small Town and Rural Division of APA. Prior to coming to Bar Harbor, Anne was the Town Planner for Reading, Massachusetts and Principal Planner for the Town of Danvers, Massachusetts. Prior to public service, Anne worked in the private sector in campus planning, permitting, and marketing. Anne holds a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Studies from the School of Landscape Architecture um, at SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry at Syracuse University. Um, let's welcome Ann Creek. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Brittany. Um, just to give a plug for Brittany, she's been a big help in organizing these webcasts and, and uh, giving me the training I need for all the technology. So um, I also want to say a special hello to uh, those members of the Economic Development Division that are here uh, today, and especially to Shauna and Adam Flux, who had organize this, um, web, uh, this webinar that is a, somewhat of a repeat uh, from a talk that I had given at the National Planning Conference last April in Boston. So uh, they've been such a great support to me, so I really appreciate their help. Also to um, those of you out there from the Small Town and Rural Division, STAR, uh, this, is a, this topic is kind of goes between those two divisions in terms of uh, its interest. Uh, my friends at LinkedIn, and a special shout out to my friends uh, from the Cyberbia um, world. Cyberbia.org is a great um, web organization of planners that uh, we all are very supportive of each other, ask great questions, and have formed some great liaisons, professional and personal friendships. So it's a it's a great place. Okay, so to get started, um, show my screen. 
this, um, oops, there we go. Um, this slideshow is actually, if you are linked in with me, this slideshow is uh, on, my, on my LinkedIn profile. So um, if you want to take a look at any of these slides again, um, I shamelessly use my children in my, um, in my presentation, so you'll see them all there. This uh, first slide is um, one of the natural resources that is on Mount Desert Island. Bar Harbor, if you may not know, is actually on a bridged island off the coast of Maine called Mount Desert Island. And this uh, shot of the Milky Way is really significant. It's probably one of the last places in the eastern seaboard in the United States, anyway, um, that, has, uh, that has a full view of the Milky Way. So it was um, denoted as a natural resource uh, by, the, uh, by Acadia National Park uh, a few years ago. And you know, I, I use this in here because it's sort of a message to say you never really know in tourism what brings people to your area. And um, the reason why we started really looking at dark skies as a natural resource at the municipal level and municipal planning level was um, we were doing some regional planning work as part of um, this effort called MDI Tomorrow. It was a regional planning group that had started um, many years ago. And when we held a island -wide, um, an island-wide session about what was important to people on Mount Desert Island, it was amazing that people all over the island, and, and we have four towns on Mount Desert Island, and it's amazing how different they are culturally and socially from each other. So the fact that this dark skies was a resource that people felt was really important was amazing. And what was further amazing about it was that the local chambers of commerce had weighed in to say, yeah, we hear from visitors, you know, through our hotels and bed and breakfast, that people come to Bar Harbor and they deliberately find dark spots in the, in the park and, you know, outside of the downtown of, of Bar Harbor and other, the other towns on the island, um, deliberately to, to look at the stars, you know, because they're, if they're coming from major metropolitan areas, which our market area uh, in Bar Harbor was um, definitely New York City, Philadelphia, Maryland, uh, the DC area and of course Boston. So um, those areas don't really have a, you know a dark sky as part of their part of their evening. Um, so it was so it was amazing. So I guess the lesson from this that I, I want to convey to you is that you just you never know what um, is going to be important to not just your residents but your visitors. So you know keep your keep your eyes and ears open to what people are saying. Okay, Bar Harbor by the numbers. Our, the population is about uh, 5,000 in the winter, and it blossoms to about 18 to 20,000 in the summer. Uh, there's uh, the every year it kind of changes depending on who you ask um, how many visitors we get, but it's anywhere between a million to three million, and th that number varies from year to year. It obviously varies a little bit with the economy, although. Uh, Bar Harbor is definitely blessed and even spoiled because uh, there there is some recession um, protection there because and I think it's because uh, Bar Harbor offers a vacation for just about every demographic. You can go to Bar Harbor on vacation um, on the cheap and you know cook all your meals at your campsite. You know the Acadia National Park has a couple of great campsites at a very low cost. Or you can stay at you know one of these hotels that are in this uh, picture in front of you um, and stay for you know uh, you know four star restaurants and four star hotels and then everything in between. So um, I think that really helps it it stay above uh, the fray, if you will, of the economy because you can you can go there cheaply or you can go there um, high. So. Uh, the assessed value, this is kind of an old number, um, but you know, real estate, comparatively in Maine, um, Bar Harbor real estate is very high. Uh, I think the, other, the only other town that might be significantly higher is, is Cape Elizabeth, which is in southern Maine, as well as um, parts of Camden. So um, you know, the, the land value in Bar Harbor is pretty high which puts, as you, as you know, as planners, when you have a high assessed value, it's wonderful, but it also brings challenges because there's a lot of pressure 
on land to perform. Um, so there's always pushing the envelope of your zoning. So your zoning is always under review, shall we say. Um, in 2007, um, I worked on a comprehensive plan with a team of great consultants and came up with um, a plan that received about 85 percent of the town meeting vote, which for Maine is massive. Those of you in other parts of the country outside of New England um, probably don't know what town meeting is. Town meeting is basically if you have open town meeting, that means everybody comes and votes. So your comprehensive plan is voted on by all the residents um, in the community. And so there's, you know, so obviously that has its challenges as well as um, when things do pass, the good news is, is that you know that people really liked it because, um, you know, because everybody has that opportunity to weigh in. So uh, the comprehensive plan, I'll give, you know, plug to say that it did win plan of the year from the Maine Association of Planners in 2008. So it's a, it's a great plan. It is on the town's website, so I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, I think one of the best parts of the comp plan for Bar Harbor uh, was the amount of public outreach that we did. Um, what we did was I, as the, the, the planning director at the time, I, um, I really ran the comprehensive plan myself. So I went out and met with the different villages, coffee shops, standing on the pier there that you see in this photo and uh, and talk to people and then assembled a plan from what I had heard. You know, I, I used the typical planning techniques of visioning sessions, but in the beginning what started the process was what I called listening sessions. And that's when I went out, um, there's a few villages, Salisbury Cove, Town Hill, Hulls Cove, that have little um, village halls. And I went out there and with a blackboard, very low tech, and just said, okay, what's so great about living in this village? And the conversations went from there, and we filled the blackboard with everything that was important to people there. And I, I really feel that that initial step of just, you know, an informal, even though it was a meeting, it was a notice meeting and the whole bit, but it was still very informal that people felt comfortable coming out because you were going to them, they weren't going to town hall. Um, you know, sometimes people are, afraid to go into your town hall. I know as planners that always sounds so strange because you're there every day, but um, a lot of people are intimidated by that, and especially in a smaller town. So um, by going out to them, you really earn a lot of respect, and I think um, that's really an important piece of when you're working in a small town, and especially when you're working, I think, in a tourist town, because a lot of times in a tourist town, residents will feel that their views are not being listened to, you know, that everything is run by the tourist industry and nobody cares what we think as residents. Um, so, you know, there's a, um, there's a stigma with that. And I think the more you as, as the planner in that small town that has a tourist element, you know, go out to residents and, and not just the visitors um, and ask questions, I think the better off you're going to be. Uh, subdivision filings, you know, it's just like everywhere else in the country are, are down. Um, and uh, there's been, surprisingly and happily, a very steady school enrollment. Unlike other parts of rural Maine, um, Bar Harbor's had a pretty steady school enrollment, in part because um, we have a, a company called the Jackson Laboratory that employs about 1,200 uh, Bar Harbor residents, so a lot of uh, the residents actually may not work in the tourist industry at all, but actually work in, in at the lab, as we call it. And um, so that helps, that definitely helps the school enrollment. So that's another word to the wise as we talk about the economy, that um, if you have something, I think it's always important to have other things going on in the community other than tourism to really keep the town or the municipality itself vibrant and because you don't have all your eggs in one basket in other words you know with the tax base in Bar Harbor is definitely the tourism industry I mean the, you know the downtown definitely caters to there are a lot of year-round stores and there's more and more that stay open year-round but still you know the tax base is by and large the hotels and, and bed and breakfast but the job base is in institutions so you know Bar Harbor's in a really good position that way because they don't rely on one thing to keep 
uh, the community vibrant. The Jackson Laboratory, there's a college called College of the Atlantic. Uh, there's also um, expansions going on out at the MDI Biolab. The Biolab used to uh, just be a summer only kind of science retreat of doing, you know, research, um, biological research on the water, but it's now become more and more, which is great for Bar Harbor, more and more a year-round institution. So um, it's still, though, primarily seasonal. I mean, right now, you know, downtown Bar Harbor, you can't necessarily go bowling down Main Street, but you can certainly um, walk down Main Street and everybody that you pass by is definitely going to be somebody that you know. Um, it really, um, for me, living in Bar Harbor, I really like that change. I like the, the vibrancy of um, a busy summer, of different people coming in, all the people from all over the country. There are families that actually write down the different license plates for every state in the country that come to Bar Harbor, and they've gotten all 50 states, even Hawaii, if you can believe it. So, um, you know, so even though it's seasonal, I, you know, there still is the excitement of, you know, when things start to open in the spring, and we, you know, sort of, there's a couple of places when they close in the, in the wintertime, we, we call it, okay, it's dead low, dead low tide in Bar Harbor because uh, this particular, you know, restaurant has closed. So, um, so it does have that element that I think as a resident is great. It does have its trials. There are always going to be, and I'm sure many of you that work in the tourist, um, um, tourist towns, especially down in Cape Cod, probably um, hear the same thing that, you know, the groans of the tourists coming in the, in the summer or if it's a winter tourism in the winter. Uh, what's, I think what's, what really helps Bar Harbor, and this is something I would encourage you to encourage in your tourist towns, is that the commercial businesses in the downtown, by and large, are locally owned. The town does not have uh, the typical chains that you that you see. There's no Gap. There's no McDonald's. There's nothing. Um, the only chain that you'd recognize there is a little Subway that's locally owned by um, a great guy and uh, a couple of gas stations. But that's it. And I think that is what really sets Bar Harbor apart from other um, tourist destinations because a lot of people have, you know, anecdotally, I've overheard people say it's really nice to, you know, just see things that aren't, that they can't get at home. You know, when people travel, they're traveling to leave home and not have the same things that they have at their house and or in their, you know, where they're coming from. So there's no, you know, none of the typical mall places. And, um, you know, even our coffee shops are local. There's not even a Dunkin' Donuts when it's in town. So it's, it's definitely very local. Um, I know the jury's out in, in um, planning law about whether or not you can control, um, you know, chains in your, in your town. And I would encourage you, if you're thinking about doing that, to, to talk at length with your town attorney because um, there, it hasn't been upheld um, in some cases. So I would discourage you from doing that. But at the same time, there are ways that you can encourage it. Like, for example, in Bar Harbor, uh, there is a ban on drive-throughs except for banks. And uh, I, I think that's one of the reasons why uh, we don't get some of the chains that other, that other places get. I also think it's because of the, um, just the specific season that the town has. Even though the season has extended in the fall, uh, for the cruise ships um, that we'll talk about later, it still is, there still is a dark, you know, um, winter time when business goes low. And just, you know, talking to somebody I, I met years ago at, uh, that works for Starbucks in looking at locations, they said the reason why they wouldn't go into a place like Bar Harbor is because, um, because there's such a downshift in the business that they need to have in order, you know, in order for them to locate someplace, they need to have business at a certain level every month. And so the fact that things go dead in the winter, where and the concept of even closing is just is not in their interest. So I I actually think more than just having um, no drive-throughs, I think just the fact that we have such a a specific season, I think, keeps a lot of uh, businesses those chains away. 
Um, I'm not saying chains are bad, but I, but my point is is that the the visitor that comes to Bar Harbor wants that unique experience. Uh, we hear it from cruise ship people that come. We hear it from our land-based visitors. We hear it from second homeowners that they like coming in and having the businesses owned by people that live in Bar Harbor. It also makes downtown Bar Harbor very um, livable and walkable, I think, because a lot of people that own businesses in Bar Harbor actually live downtown. So you have people, you know, we have a very high percentage in the state of Maine, I forget what the number is offhand, but um, there's a very high percentage of, of um, Bar Harbor residents that actually walk to work. So um, I think, you know, having those local community businesses owned by local residents is huge. Okay, so pressures on tourism. Um, one of the big issues for Bar Harbor is the employee housing uh, situation because it is, as we said, as I said, um, so seasonal. And, you know, people will only hire people for just four to six months at the most six months. Uh, most of the time it's, it's four to five months at the most. And, you know, they need some place to live. And it is an island. Um, it's a bridged island, but still it's an island. So there's only so many places people can go. And a lot of um, people that own homes in Bar Harbor, you know, want to, there's a lot of vacation rentals in Bar Harbor. Um, so, you know, they're not as willing, understandably, because of the market, they're not going to rent it to somebody just working for four months when they can get, you know, 2000 a week for a vacation rental. So people that come to work for the summer have a really hard time finding housing. And a lot of major employers, the, the hotels most notably, have a hard time finding housing for their employees. So, and there has been some housing issues where, you know, people, too many people in a house and, you know, it really just becomes very crowded and it can be very loud. Um, Bar Harbor does have a nightlife and so when the, um, the hotels, you know, when the hotel staff gets out, when the restaurant staff goes out, you could have, you, sometimes you have conflict in your neighborhoods uh, between people that live in the downtown and, and people that are there working for the summer, so having a good time at when they get out of work. So. Um, in terms of addressing that as an issue, I, I think definitely um, allowing it in certain places and having some requirements on, on how many people can be in a house I think is important. Having some kind of inspection of that, you know, of that residence to make sure that it's safe, um, you know, to make sure there are two ways out and the whole thing and the electricity is up to date because um, when you have a lot of people in the house, you know, it can be, we have had a couple of inst instances where, you know, um, some safety issues were uh, hampered by having too many people in the house. So I would encourage you, if you do have these issues, is to have some kind of, at least some kind of an inspection in place to make sure that people are safe. It's a basic um, code issue that um, I don't think you should have any problem getting through. Um, parking. Uh, just like a mall that needs a lot of parking in the at Christmas time, um, you know the town of Bar Harbor and other tourist towns. You all have parking issues in the summer uh, or in your high season, and you know I always used to say to uh, downtown merchants when they complain about parking, I would say, well, the fact that you don't have a lot, you know the fact that you have a parking problem is the good news because uh, that means a lot of people want to be here. So. Um, the I think the issue with that though is you know if you provided just like at a mall if you provided enough parking in a mall to serve your Christmas crowd well you know half your town would be paved and it's the same thing in, in Bar Harbor if you provide enough parking for the peop the number of people that visit the downtown um, in the summertime I mean you'd half your downtown would get paved and then you lose you lose what's what's important about and what's great about a town like Bar Harbor. It's, you know, it's a three-story, pretty much a three-story town in terms of the size of the buildings. It's very pedestrian um, and it's not vehicular. And so it's, uh, you know, it's very walkable. So you really um, have to be careful to not lose what's special about your town in trying to provide for parking. So, um, you know, I encourage things like parking garages and things like that and 
um, so that um, so that your visitors have a place to park and to park all day. Because the problem, of course, with two-hour parking is if they go on a whale watch and they want to go have lunch, they're going to come back to a ticket. So, you know, you have to look at that, too, to make sure you're providing adequate space for people um, that want to be there all day because you want them there all day. So uh, pedestrian safety is, is always, you know, when you have an older community like a Bar Harbor um, where the sidewalks, where the, the roads are very narrow and the sidewalks are very narrow, um, it's, you know, it's a constant challenge, especially when um, a cruise ship is in because it's all pedestrians. So, um, you know, we have to constantly look at the location of crosswalks and making sure they're clearly marked so that, um, so that people have convenient and safe ways to get around the downtown. So that's something you always have to take a look at. Um, public safety always is um, something that has to have an increase in the in the summertime and it's very difficult in the police department especially because of the training requirements somebody who works as a summer police officer needs the same training um, as somebody who works year-round so um, what the police department's done in the last couple of years is um, instead of training people to just work for the summer and then they go work for someplace else um, they just have gone to a full full-time um, staff. So there's, you know, and, and it's worked very well for the last couple of fiscal years for that department, and even though there are more people um, in the winter, and what they do in, in the winter is they're doing more outreach to the community outreach, you know, to the schools, to the high school, to the elementary school, has more of a, um, a friendly police presence uh, with the students, working with the students. So I think that has been a real positive for the community. So there's creative ways that you can, you know, have that, that stronger number of staff um, and then giving them other things to do in the wintertime. The fire department definitely and the ambulance department definitely have that issue because um, there are more instances, obviously, there's with the park, uh, with the Katy National Park, there's a lot of uh, more instances of, of injuries and things like that. So uh, fire and ambulance definitely get pushed to their limits in the summertime. And um, as, as this is happening nationally, it's very difficult to find people to volunteer for those for fire. You know, there used to always be volunteer fire, um, fire personnel, but now it's very difficult to get that. People are very busy, and again, there's a training requirement. Even if you're a volunteer firefighter, um, you need to have the same training as a professional firefighter. So there's a real challenge with that because you have to make that investment as the community, and then they're a volunteer, which you know means that if they move away or something like that, you you know you've trained them, and they're not there. So it's just something to be mindful of. Infrastructure maintenance. Um, this was definitely an issue. It continues to be an issue for Bar Harbor. You know, Bar Harbor technically, under you know, in Augusta, the um, the state capital at Maine DOT, you know, sees Bar Harbor as a town of 5,000 people. Although that attitude has changed positively over the last few years. Um, so a lot of your infrastructure monies are based upon a population of 5,000 people, which you know is a very small town, but um, but when you have a couple of million people visiting Bar Harbor, that puts incredible, incredible um, pressure on the roadway system. And if you've been to Mount Desert Island, there's only a few ways to get through. You can't get there from here, as they say in New England, and you really can't. There's, uh, you know, some, some, some of the roadway systems are just really in bad shape, and um, so that's a constant. A situation for the town because their um, their annual budget can't possibly give the capital improvements that are required to keep up with that infrastructure. But it's really hard um, in a state like Maine that is it's a it's a large state. There's um, bad roads everywhere, and and as a lot of you and other states in the country know, there's not a lot of state money out there, and there's and there's not always a lot of federal money to fix roads. So, you know that's. That's just a constant situation that, that you'll have when you have a small town but a significant amount of visitors. 
Um, the town uh, has an economic development task force. This task force was created from uh, the comprehensive plan and what their job was um, was to create um, an economic development strategy because one of the things that came out of the comprehensive plan is that there wasn't a clear direction on economic development in terms of uh, what is our strategy, what do we really want. One of the, the um, the outcomes of their work was redoing the downtown zoning. Uh, the downtown zoning had this bizarre um, line that was just going through properties. It didn't have a clear measurement off of Main Street um, in Bar Harbor. So it, it, you know, it was just kind of a crazy district. So the task force literally went lot by lot meeting with different property owners, different neighborhoods within the downtown to come up with a zone district that um, allowed for, you know, a, a lot of intense businesses on the main streets, which are Cottage, uh, Cottage Street, Main Street, and West Street, but um, as it bled into the neighborhoods to kind of down zone things. So that if you aren't on Main Street, you know, necessarily you shouldn't have a bar because, again, you know, you have that conflict with people living downtown with, as, as families, young families in many cases and having um, uses that conflict, you know, in terms of noise and, and hours of operation. So that was a, a positive thing that came out of that group. Um, the other one was um, the, uh, that hasn't had as much success was trying to rewrite the agricultural zoning to um, allow for more agricultural uses with less permitting. And, and to try to uh, jump on to something that you see, I know I've seen a few of them over in Vermont, um, the agritourism where you go and, and you live or you, know, you stay on a farm um, for a week with your family and you, know, you get to participate in the agricultural work of that farm and um, as part of your trip, that's the purpose of your trip. And so we worked on, um, some zoning to try to allow for that, and it was really difficult. There was definitely a lack of um, a lack of trust, really. I think to the process that you know the if we made it a special permit with the planning board to have this type of thing, that some big hotel wasn't going to go into a, a residential area and then plant. You know, I think the the example that was given a big a hundred room hotel with an acre of carrots next to it and, and calling it agritourism. So it was, um, you know, so that's a work still in, pro in, in, pro in progress with the, um, the planning board, but it's been, it's been very difficult. So I'm sure you all have your war stories about trying to, to do, a, you know, a good piece of zoning and, and having a hard time with that communication. So, Again, meeting with residents and, and making sure you have a, a process that people believe in and will accept, I think, is, is crucial if you're going to try to insert something like this. Because most of the farms in Bar Harbor, you know, they're not on the major corridors. There's a couple of them, but a lot of them are nestled into um, residential neighborhoods. And so, um, you're, you know, that, again, creates a potential conflict in the eyes of people. So um, that's something to be mindful of, is to make sure that you're meeting, you know, very informally person face-to-face -face with, uh, with the neighbors on those situations. The other thing that, um, you know, in the nine years that I was in Bar Harbor, the one thing I would always hear about was uh, the year-round community, that, that the town wanted a year-round community. And, um, you know, I, I just give a caution to that only because, um, as I was talking before, the chains stay out of, of Bar Harbor in part because of the season. So if you have a year-round population that can support um, a, a chain business, then they're definitely going to come. I mean, they do, they, they do their demographic work, they're, they're marketing people. Um, are amazing. They do great studies. I would love to get my hands on some of them because uh, they give you great data. But um, but if you have that year-round community, the, the good news is you have a year-round community, but the bad news is you can also support the type of businesses that you may not want to have. And you know, for a, 
for a town like Bar Harbor that has such high assessed value, um, again, the, the challenge with the high assessed value is you have very high taxes for those commercial properties, and sometimes a mom and pop business can't afford uh, either the taxes or in, in, in Bar Harbor, it's mostly the rents that really prevent people. That's why there, there is business turnover every year um, in certain buildings in, in Bar Harbor because um, of those high rents. So, you know, the role of government, can we can debate what the role of government is in there, but um, definitely be careful about, you know, going for that year-round community if you don't have one right now. Cruise ships. Um, town of Bar Harbor gets about 120 visits a year. Uh, they everything ranging from uh, the smaller American Cruise Line, you know, which has a couple hundred people on it, to um, some of the the just shy of a mega ship where they're you know 35 3,500 to 4,000 people on a ship. And remembering that the year-round population in Bar Harbor is um, 5,000, you know, you're basically at times on a two-ship day, you're bringing in more people that actually live in Bar Harbor. So um, there, there was a lot of backlash, a lot of conflict between um, residents and some business owners even, bed and breakfast community, that really had a concern about the numbers of cruise ships and how it was being managed. Uh, it's not just the pedestrians in their mind, it's the busing because there's uh, cruise ships, as you know, if you've been on one, there's, when you get off the cruise ship, there is a line of tour buses waiting for you to take you, you know, on whatever tour that you've purchased. So, um, you know, on a two-ship day, you're going to have close to 20 buses jam-packed in a, in a small area. And in that first slide that, um, where, I, let me go back to it. I'll just show you this area really quick. Um, this area in here, you can see there's a ship there at the, at the head of the town pier. I mean, that's the area that the cruise ships come into. They do not, um, the only ones that can actually dock at the, uh, at the pier are these smaller ships that you see here. The, the other ones have to um, tender in, have tender operations coming in. But you can see how congested that would be to have that number of buses in there. So. Um, what the, the chamber did, um, which I thought was wonderful, they worked with the state um, and they got some money to do a destination management plan. And the destination management plan addressed a lot of these issues with busing and, you know, to have the buses not queuing right, you know, right next to the pier that, you know, they are brought in from another location so that there isn't so much pressure and so much blocking. Um, of the pier. A lot of people go down to the pier in the morning with a cup of coffee as part of their day, so uh, we didn't want to have um, to have that stop for people, especially residents. So uh, the destination management plan um, addressed things like having a passenger cap. And in the beginning, a passenger cap, when that hit the media, um, was not viewed as a positive thing because it, you know, the word cap, you know, to the cruise industry at the time was, wait a second, they don't, you know, Bar Harbor doesn't want us there, which wasn't the case. So again, I always caution people about, you know, get ahead of the message um, so that whatever industry that you're controlling understands what the reasoning is behind it. Uh, so there's a passenger cap in the summer that's pretty low. It's only um, 3,500, but then it goes up to 5,500 in, in September and fall because most of the cruise ships that come to Bar Harbor are in the fall. And the reason why um, it's lower in the summer is uh, the land-based visitor really rains in the summer. I mean, July and August, August especially, is when most of um, our land-based visitors, visitors are coming to Bar Harbor. So there's just so much that that, that small pier that I showed you um, can handle. So uh, that's really sort of a um, a visitor management effort on, our, on the town's part to have, you know, to have that cap. And also a different fee system. Uh, before it was just so, sort of a docking fee, it was this generic fee, and then there was a bus fee. And what the committee did was they came up with a fee system that has a fee to cover the operation costs. What we did was we figured out 
how much police time, how much of the planning director's time, how much ambulance time, public works, uh, the harbor master, how many hours do they need to dedicate to this industry to provide them with services? And we um, attached a fee to that. So that was an operations fee. And then the town um, coupled that with a um, sort of a enhancement fee that allowed, you know, that, with, that all of the, um, the cruise ships when they came in had to pay this fee uh, sort of a capital improvement fee so that the town could take that, that money and do capital improvements. For example, the town built uh, new bathrooms right near the pier, right, you know, the, um, the bathrooms down on the pier, you know, are, there's only a couple of stalls in each bathroom and, you know, they were always backing up and, you know, it was a really nightmare for um, on a two on a two ship day. So. Uh, the town built where the uh, buses are stacked at Agamont Park above the above the pier. They they put in some nice new bathrooms using that fee. So again, just like with any fee, I would caution you to make sure that you're using that fee to cover costs. You know, do the analysis of how many hours you're dedicating. You know, for that particular service for that particular user, and assign a fee, and make sure when you do any kind of an enhancement or capital fee, that um, that the projects that you're picking are projects that serve that industry. I mean, the the nice thing about doing something like bathrooms is it also helps the land-based visitor because there's you know if you are in a tourist town, you know that you never have enough bathrooms. So um, so that's always a welcome thing, as well as for residents that are down um, in that area. So uh, definitely um, be careful when you set your fees to make sure that there's that nexus there. Also, if you are working with cruise, if you um, are a destination port um, for any type of cruise ships, you know, work directly with the industry. I think it was one of the best investments of time was having um, staff work directly with the industry to come up with um, something that they understood. So, you know, because this was an exponential increase in fees for them. So it, it was really important, again, to get ahead of that message and working directly with them so that they understood where their money was going. A couple of other things is uh, working on a second bus stop. Um, because the bus is going back down to the pier. If you've been to Bar Harbor, there's a huge hill coming up from that pier. And um, a lot of older passengers weren't, you know, the average age of a, of a, a cruise ship passenger is pretty high. So um, a lot of the passengers weren't going to other parts of the downtown. So again, we were able to work with the industry, work with the tour bus company to come up with a second bus stop to give, um, you know, to give that ability for the older passengers to be able to go to other parts of the downtown so that all of the businesses um, you know, reap the benefit because the as as one um, merchant had said to me, the best the best thing about the cruise ships coming is you know having that number of pedestrians that are in the downtown. You know, they don't come in cars; um, they're here. Um, you know, they're walking off the ship. So it's um, you know it's a real boon for the merchants. And again, it, you know, there's there's always going to be conflict. A lot of residents will say, "Oh, I don't you know I don't like to go downtown when there's." The cruise ship in, but um, at the same time, you know the merchants and even the restaurants. You eat so much in a cruise ship, you think they wouldn't want to eat when they come ashore, but they do, and and they uh, they're there all day, so they're eating meals in Bar Harbor. So a lot of restaurants add staff. They you know they get the cruise ship schedule and they add staff on those days. So you know definitely you know go door to door with the merchants to talk to them and 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 restaurant owners to talk to them about you know how do you respond to different times, you know, throughout the season. You know, what do you do so that you can address those? Okay, Acadia National Park. Um, Bar Harbor is made up, 40% of Bar Harbor is Acadia National Park. So it's uh, the largest landowner, if you will, um, in the town. So um, it's important for the town to work directly with the park. Um, you know, and having a good relationship, I worked very well with the park planner. Um, 
it was great that the park had a had a park planner so that you you know you had a counterpart right there uh, to work with so we were able to work through um, issues because obviously the park being 40 percent of Bar Harbor um, they you know they have a, a an understanding concern that you know the developments in Bar Harbor are going to have a negative impact on the park in a natural resource way but also in a congested way because you can see with this this view um, you know there's still a good tree cover you know even though um, my daughter's looking out uh, and to downtown Bar Harbor there still is um, you know there's still a lot of tree cover there it still is a lovely view of a, of a small town so you know you really have to have a good as your gateway community, if you have a if you have a national park in in your area, you know you're considered a gateway community, and the the most positive relationship you can have with them, the better off it's going to be. Um, there's always a lot of um, pushback, though. You know you're you're going to have residents that have a fear that you know the park is telling the town what to do. It's because it's a federal government. You know you're going to have some of that bias there um, that you have to work with, but um, but it's important as a professional that uh, you prof that you uh, establish that professional relationship um, with the National Park Service or Forest Service or whatever um, federal properties that you have in your community, because they're really an important piece. It's a very you know technically it's a symbiotic relationship. I mean people you know Bar Harbor is lovely downtown, but there's a lot of lovely towns along the main coast so you know what sets us apart is that people can come and do their shopping and 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 have fine dining in downtown Bar Harbor but then they can they can go into the park here and you know and walk on trails and never see another person you know all within 10 minutes of each other so you know that's that's really an important piece so you really want to have that positive relationship there um, Acadia National Park had done uh, some visitor surveys and some visitor management plans. They were very controversial when they were released because there was a fear in the business community that you know that there was going to be some kind you know visitor management in the same sentence. Um, you know, can be a very difficult phrase to to kind of work through if you're a business because you're saying, wait a second, we want as many people as we can and you guys want to manage it and I think the key here is is to again try to get ahead of that message with businesses to say there is a super saturation point in um, in a tourist community where too much is going to have people go someplace else and you don't want to have that happen so you know having the park put its financial resources to do this visitor management plan I thought was great because you can see where that tipping point is, they did um, they did a great survey where they showed different congestion along the Park Loop Road, which is the vehicular road that goes through Acadia National Park. Um, you know, at what point are, do you feel too congested as a visitor? And they so they were really able to kind of give us a feeling of where that super saturation point is, and you want to stay. A little bit ahead of that, and some of the ways to do that, you know, it, it's difficult in terms of role of government there. But you know, the park does things like limiting the amount of parking that's available in the park. Um, you know, the town allowing, you know, so many only certain districts allowing hotels and bed and breakfast because you know you want to have, you definitely want to have people staying in your community. You don't want them staying off island. But you also want to make sure that you have just the right amount of people to keep it busy, keep it vibrant, but not having people walk away with a negative um, impression. So challenges. Um, <laughs> I love this picture. Um, the whole concept of local being from away, you know, Bar Harbor has a large um, population like myself. I moved to Bar Harbor in 2002 from the Boston area. So, you know, I'm definitely was from away um, and not a local. You have to be a local. You have to be there for a couple hundred years as your family. So, um, you know, so there's always, you know, you're always going to be as the planner if, you, if you're in a community like that where you, you know, you have to earn that respect. Um, also, I always think that there is a challenge for any planner when economic development is also put 
um, on your desk. Technically, it shouldn't be because you know um, a big part of our comprehensive plan is planning for growth. It's not just planning against growth. It's planning for growth. So again, to try to marry that and make sure that is well communicated to people so that they understand that yes, it's a duplicative role, but the concept is is that we want growth. We want growth to go here, and um, and also as as I've been saying throughout. Uh, this presentation, there's that large population shift um, from the summer to the winter, and that again, you know, culturally, socially, can put a lot of pressure on the community. I think one of the things um, that I used to do, and I would encourage you to do that too, if you're in a tourist town, is um, do a Google alert for the name of your town. And what's kind of cool about doing that is you get uh, a lot of travel blogs from people that, you know, they, it's like their family blog or, or whatever it is that they have posted photos of, of, you know, in this case, Bar Harbor, and they talk about what their trip was like. And yes, it's anecdotal information, absolutely. It's not something that you can, um, you know, take to town meeting, but it does give you a sense of what is important to people. You know, that's where I learned about people saying, geez, they have they have things in their stores and they have stores and restaurants that we don't have at home. You know, I learned that from reading all of those blogs. So I would encourage you to do that. And even just going to places like hotel.com and looking at what people are saying, um, the reviews, of course, people hardly ever write good reviews, but at least you can read what people are concerned about. And, you know, again, that's where anecdotally I found out, you know, certain visitors that are, that do feel, you know, Bar Harbor has gotten a little crowded. And um, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting way just to get to garner those comments from people. Because again, you know, the visitor, they come in and they leave and, you know, they don't, they're not going to stop in town hall and let you know how their trip was. So, you know, you have to find other ways of getting that information. The chamber always is a great resource as well to give you um, information about visitors and visitation in general. So I would encourage you um, to always have that a good relationship with um, with the chamber to get that information from them. So um, the lessons from this is, you know, staying competitive is always necessary, and and I think for Bar Harbor, um, this this is a challenge for them because um, Bar Harbor has never felt, um, and and it's understandable that they ever needed to be competitive because you know they have a Katy National Park. Um, this is a a, a public. Um, picnic area in the park down at the other end of the island called Seawall. And, you know, there's just all these great spots. So, you know, there's sort of that attitude of, well, we don't really need to compete. But, you know, in Maine in particular, you know, the mid-coast is changing. Um, it's um, marketing efforts to, you know, to attract more tourists. Uh, the Maine Northwoods, whether you feel it's a good idea or not, um, at some point, you know, parts of the Maine woods, north woods, are going to be developed, and over the next decade or so, and so that will be that will become, you know, my prediction is that will become a major competitor. So, you know, it matters. Um, it always is good to keep, you know, to keep ahead of that competition and to see what other communities are doing. Um, you know, uh, for example, design review has always been a very, um, it's been a very challenging concept in Bar Harbor. Design review has been reviewing facades and signs in Bar Harbor for a long time, long before I got there. And, but it's always been a difficult one because of its subjectivity. But, you know, as the message that I always delivered with that was, you know, when you're a tourist town, you need to stay competitive and it matters how you look. And, it does matter what color the building is, and and that the, you know, that the building itself is at a pedestrian scale because most of your visitors are at the pedestrian scale. They're not driving through town; they're walking through town. So, those design concepts that we as planners, you know, understand completely, um, you know, are really sometimes difficult for um, a lot of your local businesses because somebody else is looking at the work that 
they're investing their money in. So you have to respect that um, and respect that property right. But at the same time, you need to get that message across that, you know, we got to keep the place looking good uh, to keep people coming here. So I think, um, I think that's important. Uh, I always find when there's, you know, during the comprehensive plan, I always used to joke that, you know, controversy brings people together. When you have something that's a target, it's, you know, it actually gets people talking and, and you can get some really good dialogue out of it. You're exhausted as the planner um, after the controversy is over, but you've actually got to see the community coming together in a good way. And in a small town that, you know, that's something that always has to be honed. Um, and again, you know, protecting your resources is, you know, maintaining that stature as a tourist community. It's really important uh, to protect um, what's special about where you are. Um, Bar Harbor's in a good position because Acadia National Park, you know, already protects its own property. So what, you know, the main thing that brings people to that area is already protected. But, you know, you may be in a community where um, you know, if it's a waterfront and there's a lot of private ownership in, in that waterfront, you may want to start looking at having some public investment in owning, you know, some of that areas that are special to people so that they are protected, so that people will come or keep coming. Um, and uh, so that's something that I would encourage you to do. Um, I think that is... Probably, I think I'm at a point where I'm ready to start taking questions. Brittany, I don't know how. Okay, great. Structure them. Um, okay, well, our first question comes in from um, Eric Olson. Uh, what role does public transportation or transit or tour buses, if any, play in your area? It is seen as an economic development tool in terms of advertising opportunities, reductions in need of, for parking, a downtown trolley, et cetera. Yep, absolutely. I forgot to mention that, so thank you for mentioning that. Um, one of the products of the NDI Tomorrow um, effort um, was creating the Island Explorer bus. Uh, Friends of Acadia, which is a local nonprofit, um, had worked with this group MDI Tomorrow, and one of the things that came out of it was to have an island-wide bus system. And they worked with L.L. Bean and uh, Maine DOT to come up with it's a free bus that goes, you know, all over the island, in and out of the park, through the park, uh, and it's and it's just an amazing. Every year the numbers go up, and what's funny is there's a huge spike in uh, bus usage on the days that um, a cruise ship is in, but also in those summers that we've had just a skyrocketing. Uh, gas prices, we've had an incredible increase in use of buses. So the Island Explorer has played a huge role in connecting downtown Bar Harbor um, with the park. The challenge with that is we try to get the hotels to encourage their um, uh, the people that are staying there to leave their car at the hotel and not bring their car into Bar Harbor and get on the bus to get on the bus at their hotel because most of the uh, the bus lines go, you know, right next to hotels because what we're finding is, you know, we have sort of this all-day parking all over the place in Bar Harbor for people that are getting on the bus to go into town. So, um, you know, so we're, again, there's that outreach with the hotel industry to try to get them to use that. We have, um, as part of the cruise ship work, tried to do an in-town um, bus system so that, again, the people that are down on the pier can walk up that big hill uh, to the top of the hill and uh, to go to the stores up there into the Village Green. So that's still a project that is pending. Um, it's, been, it's been difficult coming up with a route because, because the streets are so narrow. Uh, actually, the downtown can get pretty congested with vehicles. So, so thank you. Good question. Okay, great. Um, our next question comes in from uh, James Pona. Can you discuss the level of organization or involvement by the merchants organization? Um, yeah, there is a, a group that stemmed uh, from the chamber uh, called the Bar Harbor Merchants Association, and they have become a very strong, I don't want to say lobbying group because it can be seen as negative because it's been so positive with them. Um, they have worked really well coming up with um, new 
uh, new language for design review to make it a little bit more specific to have certain types of signs not have to go um, you know to the design review board and the chamber the you know the Bar Harbor Chamber of Commerce has worked directly on those things so um, so yeah they you know they work directly with our regulatory authorities and with the town and come to the town council pretty much every meeting you know for some kind of check-in with them um, so I you know I think that's been a positive positive change over the, the nine years that I was there okay um, our next question comes in from Douglas Martin do tourists ever complain about overly strict parking enforcement do year-round residents have a difficult time seeking certain services grocery or other stores they have to drive a long distance to on the mainland um, yeah every year there there always was the people coming into the, the police station with their their ticket to say you know this this you know doesn't make me want to come here I mean you're always going to have um, that that tourist or few tourists that come in every year but by and large um, you know one of the things that the police department did which is very subtle but it really helped with the complaints was instead of the ticket saying parking ticket it said parking fee so and you didn't get multiple tickets like in in Boston if you you know you can get three tickets for you know in the the time that you've left your car over time but in in Bar Harbor you just get the one ticket if you've left your car somewhere and and so just that little subtlety that when you pick up that slip of paper it says parking fee and not parking ticket I think did reduce the complaints a little bit um, because it's just sending the message that you were in a two-hour zone and but we didn't tow your car, we, but you got to pay us, you know, 15 bucks. So, and keeping your ticket price as low is, is important too. In terms of local residents, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, locals, if they don't live downtown, um, always have uh, a hard time finding parking, especially people that work downtown, um, because a lot of the lots that in the winter are free and you can find a parking spot pretty easily get filled up pretty fast in the summer so that's always a challenge um, but most of the residents figure out the little hiding places in different neighborhoods and things to to steal their car okay um, our next question comes in from George the barge uh, on the slide with the economic development task force you skipped the notes about good deeds going unpunished can you share your gain to pain ratio Oh man, you know, I forgot I wrote that. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's like the, the it really relates to their work on agricultural tourism. I mean, they really had, you know, here this is, is an economic development task force, which, you know, a lot of, a lot of planners and people would envision, you know, a bunch of starchy business type people at that group, but it was really a group of people that were very forward thinking and really trying to do good things and you know so they worked really hard with the planning board with the conservation commission I mean they brought in so many different people to help you know work on that language and and uh, and it really went I mean it didn't just get defeated it, it just went down in flames and uh, you know and so there's there's always that you know you're trying to do what you think is good planning and and it ends up you know failing at town meeting miserably in this case okay um so our next question comes in from Jason Langley what projects are you working on now um, I'm not with the town right now um, so I am you know working you know getting some contract work and looking for my next gig so I'm in, I'm in between gigs right now so I'm not with the town Okay. Um, our next question comes in from Rush Wicks. How have gas price spikes and dips affected the tourism to Bar Harbor? Is this something taken into account in the planning process during the peak months? Um, definitely. I, you know, I think, um, like I say, with the Island Explorer, they got a huge peak that summer. I forget what year it was that the gas prices were just out of control. Um, so you know we saw you see a big spike in the use of the island explorer bus and there there was a slight dip in people coming 
But amazingly, like I, I started out with, um, Bar Harbor's in, in an enviable, I think, position to welcome um, people from all demographics. So yeah, you may spend more getting here because of the gas prices, um, but once you get here, you don't necessarily have to spend a lot. I mean, the restaurants will will say it's it's an interesting anecdote. The restaurants will say it's a uh, a fish and chip summer, as opposed to a lobster summer. It's like people still come, they may not spend as much because they've had to spend more on um, you know on gas to get here, but they still come. The numbers still are there, so they're really in an enviable position. Okay, um, our next question comes in from Allison Lowe. Do any of your restaurants and hotels work th with the nearby farms to source and promote local food? Is there an opportunity to do that? Yeah, there's a great um, group. It's not um, sanctioned by uh, the local government. It's a, sort of a group that grew, if you will, out of itself from um, interested people. Uh, for community-supported agriculture they've worked with. In fact, it was in the comprehensive plan to get that going, is to, you know, to encourage community-supported agriculture. Like the schools, for example, um, are trying to use more uh, local uh, farms. We, you know, we have a great dairy farm. Uh, we have um, great produce. Um, we have a good pig farm. And um, you know, so more and more restaurants are are trying to use more local um, food, and as well as our our schools. So yeah, there is a group, but it's a group outside of of the town government. They started that on their own. Okay, um, our next question comes in from Stephanie McBrayer. Please talk about the role of the arts and cultural tourism in your economy. Also, is there any sort of Native American or First Nation cultural presence in the, com in the community and its economic makeup? Um, there is, most of our, the Native American population is more in what's called down East Maine, which is north of Bar Harbor. We do have, we're very lucky to have as one of our downtown anchors, a museum called the Abbey Museum, it's A-B-B-E. Um, on Mount Desert Street, and that museum is dedicated entirely to showcasing the Native American life and population on Mount Desert Island. Um, parts of Mount Desert Island were actually summer locations, although there was a winter population, but a lot of, um, of our Native Americans that were in the Bangor area actually would travel to Mount Desert Island to do summer fishing and, and relaxation with their families. So. Um, it's been a summer place for a long time. But in terms of a population there now, um, I, I'm not aware of any. Um, it's mostly in, a, in the form of a museum. It's a wonderful museum, and they, and they do great work in communicating that to our visitors, and they have good visitation numbers. Um, and I forgot what the other part of the question was. I didn't write it down when she was talking. Oh, um, please yes. talk about the role of the arts and cultural tourism in, in the economy of Bar Harbor. Well, traditionally, um, Bar Harbor was seen as, and, and still continues to be seen as an arts community. There, there are a couple of art tours, you know, open houses uh, where, you know, because a lot of our artists work in their home, and so they'll do sort of art art tours where you can go to their home studio uh, to see their work. So, you know, the island itself and Bar Harbor definitely still have that community. One of the projects that I didn't list here in this economic development piece was um, some of the zoning work that they did was to encourage and allow um, a retail element. If you're if you're a um, if you're an artist and you have your studio at home right now, we the town would consider that a home occupation. But what the zoning change added to it was that you could have a retail element to it as well, so that you could have a studio on your property and allow people to come and buy, so that, you know, just to keep encouraging um, artists to be able to live and work in Bar Harbor. Because again, you know, the, the downside of a high assessed value in your downtown is it makes it really difficult for um, galleries of local artists to really be able to, to afford that rent. We do have a couple of wonderful galleries, but um, people that have been there their whole lives have said there were a lot more um, before, and I, and I attribute it to the, um, the high rents 
that make it difficult for them to be downtown. So this is a way for artists to be able to sell their wares um, and, and not have to you know, be part of that, that high rent. I would prefer that they'd be downtown. I think it's an important element of the downtown, but um, at least to give them that ability to live and work in Bar Harbor. All right, great. Um, our next question comes in from Sue Fox. Did you work closely with the sheriff and emergency services um, for your plan? Um, absolutely. I mean, my position uh, also was the public information officer, so we had to do um, a lot of training under Homeland Security of the town uh, because of the number of cruise ships and the number of visitors to town, the good side of that is you do get a lot of homeland security funding so if you are a tourist town uh, definitely look into that uh, before it dries up but um, so I did a lot of training with public safety as part of my job which I really enjoyed that uh, we did a full-scale uh, mass rescue exercise last May you know where we had two we had two tender boats which are the the boats that bring in people from the cruise ships to the pier I had um, we staged a collision um, of those tender boats and and how what our response would be. So we had you know actual media there and it was uh, it was a great event. So yeah, I I did work very closely with public safety and and I was really grateful for that. Okay, um, our next question comes in from Peter Johnston. Is there some mechanism in place for assessing the return on public investment in tourism? Hmm. You mean some kind of a, a t I assume he means some kind of a tax type thing. Um, the town has tried in the past, it's very controversial, as you can guess, of trying to do some kind of a hotel tax that, you know, local option tax, um, so that some monies from the hotel rooms could, you know, funnel back from the state from Augusta back, you know, to Bar Harbor, so that again, Bar Harbor would be able to get some capital monies to be able to serve the population that comes. I mean, technically, it it, it, very, it makes sense, but it's been it has failed a couple of times in Augusta because um, even though uh, there's home rule in Maine, you still need to have in order to tax like that, you still need to have an act of legislature to do it. So um, it hasn't been a positive experience trying to get that through so I don't know if that answers this question <laughs> okay um, well our next question comes in from Michael Smith this might be on a similar note um, what is what's the role of room occupancy taxes in Bar Harbor if you have them where are the revenue spent and how does it play into the planning efforts yeah like I say it really it's it's failed um, you know, it's it's too bad in a way because it you know it would definitely be taxing the user, and I, I think most visitors, that most of us that travel, I know I've you know traveled all over the country, and you know you just get used to seeing that tax on the bill. You know, you just kind of factor it in, um, but but you know the local hoteliers, especially the smaller ones, were really concerned that that was going to turn business away from them, and. Um, you know, so there, so there was a local concern about it, and again, at, at the state level, the state legislature um, denied the ability. The, the couple of times it did get, it did get to that level. Okay. Um, well, our next question comes in from Amir Koss. People in mountain resort communities have a hard time accepting change. Do you have any advice on how to deal with public with a public that is in denial that their community is in a transition phase in becoming a business hub and not just a community for millionaires? Um, <laughs> yeah, that's you know that's just that day to day trying to get ahead of the message thing. I mean, I I found um, a lot of success was when I went out to them. Like I say, I went out to different villages and met in their little village houses and I, I mean I went to I went to a couple of tea parties even at people's homes. You know, to you know, to get to to work with them on a one on one basis, you know, because remember people live in a small town because they like the personal touch of living in a small town. So if you as a government official or as a professional um, can, 
you know, work on that one-on-one -on -one level with them. I know it takes a lot of time, um, but it, it does pay off. Um, and I know the times that I didn't do that, it didn't go as well. So I, you know, I think investing that time, and I know it's a lot of time, I think does pay off. Great. Um, our next question comes in from John Valdez. If you have an economy dependent on tourism but you want to diversify, what steps do you take to ensure the appropriate industry mix that will not harm the tourism or special areas? Yeah, that's always a challenge in, in planning so you don't, you know, do spot zoning. Um, you know, I think I think one of the the, um, the downtown zoning things that uh, the Economic Development Task Force did that I thought was really effective was allowing certain uses on certain that had, you know, for lots that had frontage on a, on the main road. Like I say, you know, using bars as the example, you know, there's, there's a huge population of Bar Harbor that lives in the downtown area. So, you know, trying to kind of keep that conflict um, at bay by only allowing you know, bars on the main street and not on the side streets, you know, that type of thing. I think you can use those types of zoning techniques where you really look at frontage, you know, where, where is this um, property going to go? Um, I mean, you know, what type of land use on this particular property? I think using things like the special use permit, you know, sort of special permit, whatever, you know, they call it in your state, I think is also a good thing. Um, although, you know, I always caution the special permit because um, sometimes you'll get some backlash because it is so, um, it's a sub somewhat of a subjective permit. It's not an as of right type of thing. So, you know, sometimes you get a little backlash on that. But if it's a use that you're kind of wincing at, saying, well, this would be good here, but not everywhere, you know, that's something, you know, that's when you look at the special permit. So I think, you know, those type of zoning techniques, I think, can really can really help you. But, yeah, I mean, if you allow hotels in, in your business district, then, you know, you have to assume that you may get a huge build out of that. And, and the market, yes, I, you know, I understand that the market will fix itself, but in the meantime, you may have empty buildings. And, you know, you just have to try to make sure that your district is um, small enough or large enough to accommodate, you know, the uses that you want to have or control the uses that you don't want too much of. Great. Um, our next question comes in from uh, Brian Mekle. Is there a destination management plan, as you discussed, available for viewing electronically? Yes, there is. I don't know if it's on the town's site anymore, but I believe it's on the website for, um, it's, it's called Cruise Maine. It's all one word. So if you um, Google Cruise Maine and you go on to um, her website, Amy Powers is the director. She's very helpful. Um, so, you know, you may want to, I, I'm 99% I'm sure it's still on her, her website under Bar Harbor. So you might want to look there. Um, I don't think it's on the town's website anymore, although I, if it is, it would be under planning department. So I encourage you to look there too. And that's barharbormain.gov. Okay, um, our next question comes in from Patri Patricia. How would you characterize the community's planning relationship with other adjacent coastal communities? And uh, she's writing in from the county, pla county planning in beautiful Lake George, New York. Oh, I love Lake George. I grew up in Syracuse, so I went to Lake George a lot. Um, the, uh, you know, I, the town of Bar Harbor is the only town. They don't, in fact, they're not having, they're not replacing the position. They're not going to have a planner anymore. But they, um, but when I was there, I was the only planner on the island. So the other towns do not have uh, another a professional planner. So if I interfaced with them, it was with their, um, you know, somebody on their planning board or the town manager or town administrator someone like that. So, yeah, I mean, I definitely was on an island <laughs> with that. Um, but I think by and large, you know, we, uh, the town managers meet on a monthly basis, um, island-wide, to go over, you know, what they're working on and to, to have that interface. And I think that has been very positive. 
uh, relationship there and the park is there and some of the direct off-island communities um, as well as off-islands because there's a few islands that feed onto Mount Desert Island and from you know their ferries um, and to our school system so we also need to do outreach with them but it's mostly through the town managers and not necessarily through the, the planner. Okay, okay um, so our, our next question comes in from I might pronounce this wrong. Q, Q Zhao, uh, do residents and businesses feel overwhelmed by visitors and pol pollutions from the LL Bean buses? Well, most of the Bean buses are um, have gone to electric or well propane or electric, I believe. I don't think there's very many left that aren't that. So um, I don't see that too much is an issue with that. But yeah, I mean, every year people definitely complain about, uh, residents complain about congestion in the downtown. And I mean, that's, you know, that's going to happen everywhere in a, in a tourist community. And again, I think, you know, having, like with the cruise ship situation, you know, going through the process, working with a professional that has worked with the industry like we did, uh, Mark Idle is his name. He's, he was absolutely wonderful, and you know, coming helping us come up with a destination management plan. I think was really important because it what it did was we were able to come up with, like I say, a bus queuing plan. We were able to come up with a better area for taxis and you know better controls on that situation. And you know, just really, I think it's important as the professional in you know going through that effort of meeting with stakeholders, which is what we did as part of that process, and then coming up with a way to, to get people through the area safely and efficiently. Okay, um, our next question comes in from Andrew, Andrew Dorr. Uh, what can small tourist towns um, or islands with high assessment values do to ensure affordable home and business opportunities for year-round people or families? Yeah, that has been I didn't have that as a slide, and I probably should have. Um, housing probably is one of the biggest issues uh, for Bar Harbor over the years. Um, right now, the housing market's kind of dead, so it's kind of hard to talk about housing. It's probably why it's not on there. But um, in past years, housing has been a huge issue. Like the the hospital, for example, um, they have a really hard time recruiting. You know, the island it's in Bar Harbor MDI Hospital. They have a hard time recruiting because even doctors say, oh, it's really, you know, I have to get such a small house and, you know, because of the housing value. So it is really hard. Um, and even multi-generational Bar Harbor residents will say, geez, I grew up here, but I can't live here. I have to live off island now. If you go, if you go to the bridge at, at the head of the island, it's just a steady stream of cars coming onto the island every morning. You know, going to the lab, going to Hinkley uh, Boat Company. I mean, there's, it is, it, it, it's clearly an issue. We have tried um, a couple of um, uh, housing projects with the housing authority, and they've been difficult, you know, because what we try to do is we try to do good planning and do, you know, cluster development, but, you know, somebody moving here from Long Island and, you know, they want their two acres, you know, they don't want to be in a, in a cluster. So we have a market, you know, we have a, a market issue of trying to do affordable housing for people that are coming here to work at the lab and, you know, they're looking at the house saying, well, this neighborhood is no different than the neighborhood I left and they, like I say, they want their own space. So it's, so we have a market challenge as well as a cost challenge, and um, it's you know it's just going to be a perennial issue, I believe. Okay, um, our next question comes in from Randall. Um, is Bar Harbor seen as a destination for retirees? And if so, does the comprehensive plan address this? Also, would you say the downtown caters more to tourists or residents? Well. I think you know the average age definitely has gone up in the in the 2007 comprehensive plan. I think it was it was like at 47 years old, and in 1990, which was the last comprehensive plan prior to that one, you know it was like 44. 
So, you know, obviously, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people, I, I noticed it on the different boards and committees that were what I would say young retirees, you know, they're in their in their late 50s, early 60s, still very healthy and vibrant, and um, and they, you know, they moved to Bar Harbor and telecommute in some cases and, uh, and move there. So there's definitely an increase in that population because, you know, for them, um, you know, they sell their home in their major metropolitan area and they make, you know, good money on that sale. So 350000 for a three-bedroom Cape to them is a good deal. If they're coming from Connecticut where that same Cape would have been 700000 So, you know, that it does, and that kind of pushes up those housing sales. That and the vacation rentals definitely push up the, the price of housing um, and is having that population. So it makes it harder for you know, younger families that are just starting out to buy a house. Um, in terms of services, uh, I know the, the y, our local YMCA, we have a great YMCA, they, um, they have done a lot of more services for that aging population. The town itself is not, um, but the YMCA has really, has really picked up the ball on that. And in terms of the downtown uh, commercial, it's funny, the ones, the stores, it, you know, it's, it makes perfect sense. The stores that close in the winter are the stores that really cater to the tourist, and the ones that stay open year-round are the things, the places we all go to, you know, the kitchen supplies, the, the bookstore um, that's sort of like almost like a five and dime as well as a bookstore, um, places like that. They stay open year-round. Um, but, yeah, a lot of, you know, things that sell T-shirts and things like that, yeah, they do shut down. Okay, um, I think this will be our last question. It comes in from Susan Poplin. Are there significant differences in design standards along the Main Street compared with those back from or off the Main Street in Bar Harbor? Um, no, but that's a good idea. They probably should be. Um, no, the design standards really just speak to things like um, having the scale, like if you're putting in a new building, having the scale be in line with what's around it. So it's a very much of in relying on the environs of that building. So, um, you know, so the board goes and looks at the area to see what's around it. And, you know, some of the more controversial projects were because the, the building, the proposed building was at a scale that was that much larger than the buildings around it. We did try for a little while having a um, a performance standard of floor area ratio, and the and your floor area ratio was an average of all of the abutting properties' floor area ratios, and that was what was assigned to you. Um, it was a great idea, and it worked well for a while. But then, you know, you had those anomalies that drive us all crazy as planners. You had those anomalies where you know, somebody would just be trying to put in a little shed off the back of the, the house and they wouldn't be able to because of, you know, because of this FAR thing. So we ended up, we ended up taking it out of the ordinance, but um, I'm still not saying that FAR isn't a bad approach, but you just have to really be careful about those little anomalies if you use that approach. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you, Anne, so much for uh, this presentation today. Um, also, thanks to the thank Economic you. Development Division for sponsoring it today. Um, so, uh, for the attendees who are still here, I'm going to go over a few reminders in, ju in just a moment after I get my, my screen loaded. Um, thanks again, Anne. Thank you. Okay, well, for those of you who are still with us, uh, I'm going to go over a few reminders. First off, to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, please go to www.planning.org slash CM. Select uh, today's date, Friday, February 3rd, and then select today's webcast, Opportunities and Challenges in Rural Tourism Planning. Um, this webcast is available for one and a half CM credits, and we are also recording today's session, so you will be able to find a recording of this webcast along with a PDF um, at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast-archive. And this does conclude today's session, and I want to thank everyone again for attending.
Are we off? Yeah, um, you're you're free to go. Okay. <laughs> thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Mm-hmm.